Please open your Bibles today to James chapter 1. We'll be continuing uh, this morning in our study of James, looking at verse 17 and verse 18. We have been looking at responding to the temptations and to the troubles of life. When uh, something unmistakably good happens to us or in the world, we say, praise God. God is good. We have uh, friends that uh, have a baby or uh, someone gets a promotion at work. Someone gets a prize at school. We say, you know, praise God, isn't this wonderful? But what happens when things like, well, Russia invade the Ukraine? We know there's going to be death and destruction. We don't say, oh, praise God, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that good? We do respond and relate to evil very differently. And there is a reason for that. Even though we acknowledge God's hand in all things, good and bad, the truth is we do respond to evil and wickedness differently because that does reflect God's heart. God doesn't rejoice in sin and in evil. God is not happy or pleased when people rebel against him and do the wrong thing. Uh, we have seen already in James 1, verse 16, that we are not to be deceived, my beloved brethren. And the, the context of this self-deception is, is around what we think of God in the middle of our temptations. Now, the, the testings and trials of life easily become temptations to sin. When uh, frustration comes, delays come, difficulties come, uh, we, um, you know, life isn't as smooth as we would have hoped for, as we would like. We're not seeing the progress that we would expect to be made. And so it's uh, very tempting to uh, cease to give thanks, to uh, look for God's help, and we begin to judge God harshly. God, why are you doing this to me? It's like, Lord, you're, you're, it's like you're the one tempting me with evil, but friends, there's only one tempter in the Bible, <laughs> and that's Satan. He is the tempter. We saw last week from verse 13 that God himself cannot be tempted by evil. He is untemptable. Temptation holds no attraction to him. Nor does he himself tempt anyone. He is not the author of our sins. He is not the author of our departures from him. Sin is repugnant to God. And yet, the truth is that God is still in control of a world that has rejected him. Still in control. At times, he permits what Satan desires to do and even what sinners desire to do. Even what his people desire to do when they do not trust him. And so he is over all. Isn't this what Joseph said at the end of Genesis when there he is with his brothers and you know, Joseph holds their lives in his hand? These, these good-for-nothing brothers, these good-for-nothing guys that, that sold him and betrayed him and they still don't trust him and they're shaking in their boots. And he says, look, as for you, you mean evil against me, but God meant it for good. God allowed you to do this to me so that, so that one day I could rescue you, but even beyond that, to rescue God's promised people. It was redemptive. Speaking of Judas Iscariot in Mark 14, the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better if he was not born. Yes, it was predicted and decreed that God's son would be betrayed to, to highlight, underscore human wickedness. But, but Judas 
Iscariot was responsible for his own sin. In Acts 2, 23, Peter says that him being delivered, Jesus being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put him to death. This was your sin, Peter says, and you'll answer for that. Uh, so God is not, is not the bad guy in our temptations and in our sins. Uh, God is there to make a way of escape for us, to help us, to quicken and enliven and to strengthen our faith. He doesn't tempt us to sin. He himself cannot be tempted. And in fact, James, James emphasizes that again by, look, by verse 17. Look at verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variation or shadow of turning. Every good thing that has come our way has God's fingerprints on it. God is guilty of every good work. <laughs> every good work. Even if it's come from the hand of a loved one, an employer, a friend, a teacher, whatever it is, every good and perfect gift proves there is a good God in heaven. And the implication is that's what he always does. He doesn't do anything else. You can't read it the opposite way. Every evil and wicked gift comes from, well, below. <laughs> You've you, you got to adjust the whole verse, you see. No, God is the giver of good things. And when God made the world, he made it good. He made it good. Romans 5 tells us that by one man, sin entered into the world. You can thank Adam for that. But as the perfect representative man, he represented us. We would do the same thing if we were in his shoes. God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Now I realize we live in a world where that is not accepted. That is scoffed at. Uh, it, it is the last thing you will hear. The last thing you'll hear. But thank God you'll get it here. Because we've got the Bible open. And James has said it. It emphasizes that God is intrinsically, intrinsically in himself, only good. Now, he's in control. He's sovereign. And as I said, he, he can use and direct even bad things, even wicked things, even terrible things. But he is presented to us as the one who continually gives good gifts to his children. Okay, And right now... I'm going to stop the message and you can, you can all write down a hundred good things, okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll come back. I'll go get a coffee and I'm going to come back. I'm going to mark it. You don't believe me, do you? This would be a great way to finish the sermon today. Get a pen and paper out and give me a hundred. Give me a hundred, right? But is it not true? It's the issue. It's true. We often forget it, but it's true. Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. When was the last time you dwelt upon every good and every perfect gift? Because there are many of them, many of them. And I think this... This proves our sinfulness. It's not the outward acts of depravity. It's the inner thanklessness. It's the thanklessness. Right? 
It's not the adulteries and the murders and the this and the that. It is the fact that, that, that we can, you know, live our life thinking that God isn't good. And we might dwell upon the half dozen, dozen really difficult things that we haven't found answers to and, and, and miss, miss the tens of thousands of good things God gives to every single one of us. Dwell on that. It comes down from the father of lights, the father of the universe. Every evening, God lights up the sky. Sometimes in the city, you don't, you know, it's 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 the pollution. You don't always get a nice view of all those lights. But if ever you get to look up at the sky one evening and try and count the stars, try and say, well, I, I've counted this many stars. How many can I match them to a blessing? And I think of so many blessings today that God has given me. This expression, "Father of of lights." Is one of the Old Testament or the uh, the expressions for God by the by the Jewish people. Uh, there was a prayer repeated before the the Shema in Deuteronomy six. It was like a benediction that the Jews would pray, and it was this: "Blessed be thou, O God, O Lord, King of the world, who formed the light and created the darkness." who makes peace and created everything, who in mercy gives light to the earth and to those who dwell upon it. Blessed be the Lord our God for the glory of his handiwork and for the light-giving lights which he has made for his praise. Blessed be the Lord our God who has formed the lights. Those, those lesser lights that rule by night, so to speak, are meant to remind us of God's goodness but what we do is what we do is we take our grievances and we make them like the sun and the moon <laughs> we make them like the sun and the moon and, and, and we magnify them and we forget how good the Lord is a child can can complain that that there is you know they've got to go to bed by 9 30 or 10 p.m and yet forget all of the many blessings that they have been favoured with every day. We do it. We do it, friends. The Lord wants us literally to look up these numberless stars which scientists cannot, cannot agree on an exact number. And you know why they don't know? Because they're not God. They didn't make the stars. They weren't there when he did. They can only guess. Psalms tells us that he knows them and calls them by name. The goodness of the Lord. If you go back to verse 17, with whom is no variation or shadow of turning. There's this idea of he doesn't move like the shadows move. It's like that parking spot you look for on a very hot day. And yes, you can get shade, but that shade isn't staying put. You've got an hour or two of shopping. You've got to get back to that car. Otherwise, it's going to be really hot and warm. That shade is going to move. It ain't staying still. God is not like that. An old, an old music teacher, an old music teacher was once asked by someone, what's the good news today? Well, the old crusty teacher, he walked across the room, he picked up a tuning fork, and then he struck it, and the note sounded. And he said, that is an A. It is A today, and it was A 5,000 years ago. It will be an A 10,000 years from now. The, the soprano upstairs sings off key. The tenor across the hall is out of tune. He struck it again. That is an A, my friend, and that is the good news today. It's going to stay that way. Well, how much more God? 
He's faithful, dependable. His light in him is no darkness at all. Malachi 3 6, I the Lord do not change. 1 John 1 5, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Uh, Hebrews 13 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. If he, if he did change like the shadows, how could we put our trust in him? How could we put our trust in him? If we don't know what he'd be like this afternoon or tomorrow. God is the author of goodness in our life. And and if we're not convinced by James already, look at verse 18. Look at verse number 18. Of his own will, or as he decided it would be, as he decided it would be, he brought us forth by the word of truth. It's a birthing illustration. There's one earlier to do with sin, the way sin ultimately births death. But when God's involved in a birth, it brings life. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. That we might be a kind of, a kind of first fruits. And here we have an agricultural example of his creatures. James says, you're questioning God's goodness. Questioning whether he's he's the one giving you a hard time in temptation. Well, he gave you salvation. So good he is. He gave you salvation. He gave you forgiveness of sins. And he rescued you. And he delivered you. And you're pointing the finger at him. How did he become so bad to you? How did he become so untrustworthy? He's the one who gave you salvation in the first place. You're the one that praised him and gave him glory. This is what he has done for you. And it was of his own will. Not grudgingly. God wanted to give you this salvation. Now in chapter 2 and 3, James is going to talk about faith. What is true faith over against what is... A false counterfeit. But he's not talking about that in chapter 1. He is talking about in chapter 1 the fact that God gave his children the perfect ultimate gift because he wanted to and he decided to and God pulled it off. He achieved it. He did it. Not in a half sense God doesn't do 80% of salvation and he, he, he makes us churn out and, and, and get the rest done so we're over the line. Uh, we're going to be saved or not at all. A person is going to know God through his son Jesus Christ or not at all. Not at all. He's going to be in the light or he's going to be in the darkness. But when someone comes to Christ by faith, God saves them. And that's why I bring glory to God. Because he does that for us. Only he can do it. But the means here in verse 18 is by the word of truth. By the word of truth. And that's where our Bibles come in. How does God show us our need of Christ and how does God pull it off? Through his powerful word. That's how. Faith comes by hearing, Paul says in Romans 10, and hearing by God's word. That's how God does it. It's through God's word we see the truths about ourselves and the truths about God. Maybe there are some here today that haven't haven't yet, you haven't yet put your faith and trust in Jesus. Friends, you must do so. You must do so. Otherwise you'll perish. And when people are saved by hearing the word of truth and receiving it, they become something. They become something. Look at what James says at the end of verse 18. That we might be, that we might be a 
kind of first fruits. Now, James isn't uncertain. He's not saying, well, we're kind of like this. Maybe we're like this. No, no, he's very certain. This is, this is what these believers were. They were the beginning, the first fruits, they were the beginning of a great harvest. A kind of first fruits. The Jews would bring the first, usually the best of their crops, to God as an offering. And of course, the temptation is well, maybe I'll give God the second fruits. <laughs> Give me the second fruits. I want to try the first fruits first. I want to make sure they're good. Now bring God the second or third fruits. No, 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 friends. No, no. You bring God the first fruits. Give God the first bite, so to speak. Give him the first fruits. Because the first fruits predicted more to come. More to come. The first fruits predicted pointed to a greater harvest. And these first century Christians certainly were the, the, the first round of gospel salvations. They were the beginning of a great harvest. And that harvest, friends, has been coming for two millennia. It is a long harvest. It's a long harvest. How do I know the harvest hasn't ended? Because Jesus hasn't yet returned. That's why. There's a harvest still going on. Stephanus in, in, in 1 Corinthians 16 was the first fruits of Achaia. Maybe you're the first fruits in your family. It means that there will be more to come. Because Jesus has, has not returned yet, there's still a harvest to come. That's why we're still here. That's why we have this church. Because there, there is a harvest that we need, with God's help, to be bringing in. It's been said that God's gifts are always better than Satan's bargains. Oh man, the thing Satan offers always heavily discounted. <laughs> They're giveaways. But you end up paying for them later. You pay for them later. In Proverbs 10.22, it is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and he adds no sorrow to it. I want you to turn as we conclude today to 2 Samuel 12. 2 Samuel 12. And I want you to see a conversation that takes place between the prophet Samuel, sorry, the prophet Nathan and David, when uh, Nathan confronts David after his sin. And Nathan's certainly a brave man. But I want you to see what Nathan highlights to the king. Because for David, it's going to be truth time. It's truth time for David. God lovingly exposes David, lovingly points him to his repentance. And look at verse 7 of 2 Samuel 12. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. That's a great privilege, right? I mean, when he's the king, everything else follows. Everything else follows. He's the king. He's the most important guy in the country. The palace, the servants, the this, the that. I mean, everything comes with being king. He said, I gave you king. I made you the king. Then I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I get rid of your enemies for you. I clear out the enemies. Verse 8, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping. I gave you all that Saul had. Even when David had more than one wife. God's blessing him. Look at verse 8 again. And gave you 
the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would also have given you much more. God says, David, I would have, if you had asked, I would have said yes. But my goodness and blessings were not enough. Don't think, don't think that, that David's fall was just about lust. It wasn't just about lust. It was a man living, living without really thinking about God's goodness to him. Despite the abundance of what God had given him. Same, so same is true with us. Same is true. It's not just what I did, what I said. It's what I wanted. It's what I wanted. It's what was driving me. I want, I want to be in charge of my life, not God. I wasn't happy with the things he gave me. I wanted more, thanks very much. And then we come into that dangerous and uncharted waters of sin. God only gives good gifts to his children. Yes, he uses the evil ones. But his goodness to us is everlasting.